Erbil, Kurdistan, 6th of June, 2010. I leave off stories, experienced or invented, imaginary and imagined. I leave off stories to tell and stories to listen to. There are stories about possible projects, stories about shared memories and about unforgettable adventures. There are stories that you tell in the hope that by telling them, you will be able to forget. There are stories that help you understand what you think, where you stand, and where you're going. And there are stories that are supposed to give explanations, but instead create more confusion. Telling stories is a way to make the daily life special, to give value to small things, to focus on details that otherwise would risk being overlooked. Gathering stories is about curiosity, adrenaline, the, the sense of the limit, the challenge of the unknown. It is about collecting details, seeking for the right word that could com uh, communicate smells and sensations of places otherwise remote. It is about choices, directions taken, doubts about the present, and promises for the future. Bangalore, India, 27th of March, 2012. I've come back from Srinagar, the summer capital of Kashmir, a week ago, and the voices and the details of the city are still vividly present in my memory. The Dal Lake, the snow-capped mountains, the windstorm that shook the, my last night in the city and got mingled with the lamenting voices of women praying to fight their fear. Srinagar is not leaving me. I would like perhaps some distance, but it has decided to stay with me. The Kashmir of the almost forgotten conflict has crept under my skin. Agashai Dali, the poet who more than anyone gave voice to the unique mixture of beauty and brutality that seems to be the essence of the valley, has been my guide. I've looked at his valley through the lens of his words. And Srinagar inevitably became also for me what he called the city of daughters, a city where almost every man has a police record, if not as a suspect, as a spy. It seems, in fact, that there are 170,000 uh, spies for a population of 10 million. A city where women make life go, uh, go on. In silence, away from indiscreet gazes, and away from the clamors of public domain. And so it is that also the apparent quiet that surrounds Srinagar, the renewed presence of tourists, the rhetoric of the regained stability acquired a new meaning through the verses of Agashaya Dali when he quoted Tacitus. They make a desolation and they call it peace. It is not the first time that I experienced this kind of desolation. It hit me in Palestine, in refugee camps in Iraq and Tunisia, in the slums of Pakistan. But it seems that this desolation has now come back to claim a long overdue credit. A credit of years of stories that I listened to, collected and preserved in my memory. Of tales of lives and places that I visited, felt and shared through my writing. How can I do justice to so much richness and pain? How to give proper credit to those who tell you that they feel guilty to be happy when their country is under an oppression that seems to never end. How do I sail this big sea? Where is the compass that leads the path so as to preserve a sensitive eye and yet avoid pitiful sympathy? How can one tell about the power of human dignity without risking the objectifying gaze of the anthropologist who looks for truths? Questions multiply, and the answers seem to slip away. Hitting the road is the only solution I know. The source for more questions that animates the quest for more answers. The road 
and a desire for care, dedication and attention, in my words and in my politics, towards the people and places that have told and continue telling me these stories. Kabul, Afghanistan, 24th of July, 2016. The day after is always difficult. Yesterday's suicide attack has been the worst in Kabul since 2001. The victims were all civilians, all young. A terrible blast for the already fragile heart of the city. With the sobering and heavy attitude that characterizes a national day of mourning, the city this morning woke up and went on with its business as usual. Kabul is a strong city, a city that reacts and does not break. Her formidable resilience is one of the first things that one discovers and one of the first things one falls in love upon moving there. Life goes on no matter what. You roll your sleeves and move on. This is a way of looking at the world that is a source of profound inspiration. This morning, I woke up with a thought that I still can't get out of my head. I keep thinking about those who clean the city, about those who work before daybreak to remove all the traces of, horror, of a horror such as yesterday's. It is well known that Kabul's uh, strength is in her ability to start afresh every time, but we don't know anything about those who make it possible about those who scrub the blood off the asphalt, who collect what remains, who hose away all that has to disappear. We probably owe them the fact that we can move on. To those silent restorers of normalcy, to those who in Kabul or Baghdad or Srinagar have the task of disguising smells, of remodeling the facade of the ordinary, of hiding the traces of traumas that are too difficult even to imagine. I don't know who they are. I don't know their faces, and I wonder what they may think, a prayer or a curse, while they clean up surrounded by the night. I thought, however, it was important to write about them, to exercise this obsessive thought, but also to, play, to pay my respects to those who probably without knowing allow us to look ahead into the future. Kabul, Afghanistan, 7th of January, 2019. Snow in Kabul paralyzes the airport. Someone says it is because of ice on the runway. Others think that the problem is with the raiders that confuse snowflakes with other flying objects. My stopover on the way, to, uh, on the way back uh, was in Istanbul, where the plane from Italy arrived late. I didn't worry too much, as I was pretty sure that the flight to Kabul would be delayed because of the weather. But when I landed, I saw a blinking red last call on the airport display. I rushed to the gate, thinking that I would be the last person to board. The plane was full, mostly young men in their 20s and 30s, looking lost. There was a strong smell of sweat and unwashed clothes. We had been on the runway for over half an hour when the captain announced, only in Turkish and English, that because of the bad weather and for reasons beyond his control, the plane was indefinitely delayed. He then invite, invited us to disembark, but not before the arrival of the Turkish police. With an emotionless voice, he added that before we could leave the plane, we had to wait for the policemen to complete the formalities to get the deportees off the plane. The young Afghan men on the plane were therefore some of those who arrived illegally to Europe and that many European countries are now sending back to Afghanistan. Deportees. The honesty of the definition hit me like a blow. 
Maybe he didn't intend it as a political statement, but the simplicity of the Capitan sentence made me realize the scale of the horror that I was helplessly witnessing. In the narrow corridors of the airplane, the young men walked one by one, close to one another, eyes full of fear. The night outside was freezing, and the majority of them only had light jackets and thin jumpers. There was a snowstorm, and some of them were only wearing sandals. All of them had a big see-through plastic bag, underwear, socks, a pink towel, all exposed, no consideration for any sense of private decorum. I'm there. I see all this and I say nothing. I'm incapable of gathering enough courage to denounce the insanity of what is happening in front of my eyes. Just before Christmas, a friend of a friend asked me to help out uh, a young man who had been sent back to Kabul after living for 20 of his 23 years abroad as a refugee. I barely managed to get in touch with him. He was terrified, knew no one in Afghanistan, and was on his way to cross the Iranian border to see some of his family members before trying to reach Europe again. A few months ago, I read about a boy who had been repatriated. Yes, forced deportations are called repatriations so as not to offend any delicate soul. He was killed in one of the recent bloody attacks in Kabul. He had arrived in Afghanistan the day before. These are the young men that xenophobes around the world attack foaming at the mouth. They are the ones who threaten our security, our acquired rights. They are the ones who mine our civilization. It only takes a glance to these people's faces to understand that the only thing at risk here is our humanity. I plead guilty to indifference justified as ignorance. I had read about these deportations. Some of my, co some of my colleagues had told me that uh, their flights back were full of young men escorted by the police. I knew about it and I ignored it. I had to see with my own eyes to realize the immensity of the horror in which we are complicit. Now I'm writing to placate my guilt and in the hope that my words can help others to see what is easier to ignore. Fear is making us blind. We look away to avoid taking a stance. I was not strong enough to get up and shout my indignation. I felt I was dying inside and I was not ca capable of speaking up. Apathy facilitates fascism. Never like now, staying silent means complicity. But alone one cannot, or at least I cannot, overcome the insurmountable barriers of indifference. The choice of solidarity the choice of humanity is inevitably a collective one, spoken out loud, suffered and felt with a shared heart. This is probably why I'm writing today, not to feel alone, to know that I am not alone. Thank you. <laughs>